You're back for more. Maybe a few more of you, a few less. I scared some people. Did I scare anybody away? I wouldn't know if I did. They wouldn't be here. All right. Well, we're going to get through this. It's a heavy topic, isn't it? In many ways. But we'll, we'll get through it tonight. I'll get my wife home in time to watch the season premiere of her Hallmark shows. I think her and Jeannie need to start a, a Hallmark uh, group. Pastor Jeff and I will start a support group for husbands of wives who watch Hallmark movies. I'm going to be honest, I'm probably going to be watching it with her tonight after this just to give my mind a break. And admitting that may disqualify for me from speaking on any subject like this. But, uh, you know, I think at this time, you know, that's kind of a break from, from some of the things going on in culture. Although I told my wife, I said, it's coming to everywhere. And she was watching one here a while back. And at the end, it was like the end of a wedding. And they're panning the crowd and all the couples at the reception. And sure enough, I think... Uh, it's coming to a Hallmark channel near you, some of the stuff we're talking about. Uh, it's already things in schools. This last week I talked to three different people, schools, had issues of who's in what locker room and all these type of things. Two people at the door today told me that uh, they've got uh, people in their family. One, a 17-year-old granddaughter who's uh, uh, feeling that her identity is a little different than, than they were uh, uh, new or growing up. I mean, all these things are issues. You can't avoid them. Uh, they're there. And so last week, uh, we started a conversation, which was really me talking and hopefully you listening to some of it, but it laid a foundation for a discussion that we need to keep having about the church's response to issues of sexual orientation, gender identity, our intersect with the LGBTQ community and so forth, because we need to understand uh, where we stand on these issues and how we're going to have to respond to people who have tough questions in the days ahead. Your kids, grandkids are going to have tough questions. A lot of us as well, as all this progresses. And there's so much uh, misinformation out there, as we looked at last week, being passed off as truth, while the real source of truth is being largely ignored. And some of the answers that we may take for granted, a lot of people, it just doesn't register with them. My pastor got up last week and talked about the end about how Jesus pointed out very distinctly, uh, you know, the, the marriage and, and, and instituted that and sanctioned marriage between a man and a woman. But I'll tell you what, people out in the culture, that doesn't stand with them. They know that's in there. What they want to see as well, just because he said this doesn't mean he didn't say this, that all wasn't an issue there. And they want to see it spelled out literally which I don't even think is enough because of how little disregard for our culture has overall for the biblical view of marriage. And I'm not just talking same-sex marriage. I'm talking how lightly it's taken in all kinds of ways. The, the Old Testament law that we went back to where these things were cited to begin with, you know, it's in the midst of a lot of other things that nobody would say oh, that stuff is acceptable. Uh, you know, we were talking about how they're saying, well, it's in with laws on clothing and food and all that stuff. Well, it's in the middle of a bunch of laws that most people say, no, that stuff is really out of bounds. It except for two things in there. Most people would have no trouble uh, these days with the same sex issue or with the adultery issue. And there's a lot of ways we disregard things in marriage and all ends of things and uh, don't take God at his word even though it's clearly outlined in both the Old and New Testament. And a lot of times I look at that and say, you know, I think the only thing that may start turning some people's uh, impression of how they view the Word of God is if they see it come to life in an undeniably powerful way in us. I've been starting to pray, God, you show yourself in a powerful way. If we're preaching the truth, if we're latching on to the truth, begin to show yourself in our midst. Begin to show yourself in this place so people can see. I know that's not going to be the thing that convinces everybody, but he told us that those type of signs would accompany the preaching of his Word. And I just pray, God, begin to show us those so you can confirm your Word with those signs following because so many people, the only glimpse a lot of people are going to get of the word or at least their first impression is what they see in your life and mine. So what is, what is our life showing them? That's part of what I want to challenge you with tonight. The last week we covered point one of a three-point message and that was the, uh, the, the longer point, just laying the foundation of truth. And from the scriptural side, we looked at a broad swatch of passages, both Old and New Testament, that were dealing with the same-sex relationships in various contexts. And we considered that how in arguing their case that these things don't apply to us today, the critics basically end up doing one of four things in their approach to the Bible. First of all, uh, they add something to scripture, or they read something into it that doesn't appear to be there. The second thing that they'll do is they'll take something out of scripture a lot of times. 
The third thing is they kind of discount or diminish certain parts of Scripture that doesn't measure up to other parts that they, they hold as credible. And the last thing is they simply kind of imply by the depth of meaning they're trying to dig out is it's something that the average person couldn't even understand without a theology degree. And I don't think God intends for his word to be that difficult to understand. The irony in all that is some of the people who dig deep at all this stuff in the background and what's going on in the culture, and that's all stuff we need to do, but they miss the deepest thing of all, but yet it's the most practical, and we talked about that. It's the principles that underline those portions of Scripture. We went back to some of the more obscure things, some of the real prominent things, and talked about how it's the principle. You've got to get back and look at how all these things fit. And the principle, most of the time when it's talking about behavioral and moral issues, is pretty straightforward. When God says you ought not to do this, there's a reason for that because that leads to some things down a road where you don't want to go. So we looked at that biblical side of things, and the fact that you just can't say, well, it's Old Testament, it doesn't apply, or that's Paul's opinion, so it, it doesn't apply, or that doesn't jive with the other parts that I really like. And all of those arguments, what they really reveal uh, at, at the underlying thing is that most of these critics simply don't regard the whole of Scripture as the inspired, infallible Word of God. They regard it as something else, some gathering of things, but they just put it on a different level than most of us will. On the cultural side, we looked very briefly at the array of uh, orientations and identities represented by the LGBTQ acronym. We recapped a little bit of history uh, of what's gone on, how things have gotten, where they're at, where they're at now, where they appear to be going. And we see that that progression has taken us from the point where things no longer fall into distinct categories of, of sexual orientation, but now it's an entire spectrum uh, of identities, thus the, the rainbow symbol. We talked about how that's been in, in effect for a long time, and that's ultimately what this has all been getting at. So from both the biblical side and the cultural side, what we saw is that the world's view of both the Bible and themselves, and they wouldn't argue with this because they think this is enlightened, but their view of the Bible and of themselves is that that truth is constantly fluctuating and shifting and evolving to fit people's ideas and preferences and identities. And in contrast to that, we see God's message that is stable and constant and unchanging because God himself never changes. And people need to decide which side of that truth they're on. But I can tell you that churches who begin to compromise uh, their beliefs because of people's lifestyles rather than to align with God's word, when they start uh, swapping his truth for their truth, they're going to fall into the category that described in 2 Timothy 3, 5 that says it's nothing more than a form of godliness, but lacking any of God's power. But you can rest assured that if you're holding fast to God's truth, you're on a stable foundation. You don't need to compromise. You don't need to be intimidated into a, uh, accepting some other worldview because if truth is real, it doesn't need to shift and evolve constantly to fit every new preference or identity. And then we wrapped up by just considering this thought. And that's the fact that knowing the truth is really not enough. Because I could go into a lot of facts and reasoning and it might bolster your faith and inspire your confidence in the truth, but it's not going to do you any good and it's definitely not going to do anybody on the other side of this issue any good unless we approach both God and other people with the right attitudes. So I want to get to Romans chapter 2. So uh, get into the scripture here, look at Romans chapter 2. We'll get there in just a second. But you've heard several of the pastors refer to the fact that grace without truth is meaningless. Grace without truth is meaningless. But truth without grace can be just plain mean. And Christians have erred on both sides of that equation. The hard part is reaching that middle point, striking that balance. But we need to figure out how we can communicate the truth with kindness, because a lost world is never going to receive the truth unless it's wrapped up in grace. So I want to pick up where we left off last week. We were in Romans chapter 1 for a piece of the time, talked about God's judgment coming on all those who refused to recognize and honor God even though he made himself apparent, but instead they insisted on going their own way. But in Romans chapter 2, kind of turns the focus back to the church, and it starts to speak very directly to us about the need for the next thing I want to talk about tonight. So let's look in Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. It says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. Again, this is following up with the stuff that was talking pretty distinctly about these issues in chapter 1. Turning it on us. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. 
So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet you do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience? And then look at verse number four. Look at the end of verse number four in this. It says, realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is what leads people to repentance. Now, it doesn't just say his acceptance. Okay, he didn't just uh, change his mind all of a sudden about the things he just condemned in chapter 1. But those who are caught up in those things will never see the need to repent, to change direction, unless they experience God's kindness. And that is happening through us. So it's crucial in our lives that grace and truth be fused together. And that's where the second thing I want to emphasize comes in next to truth, and that is humility. Humility is the segue between uh, grace and truth. It's the connection. It's the bond between grace and truth. Now, don't you ever forget this. No matter how much we know of the truth, no matter how much we believe in God, that doesn't put us above anyone. Romans 3.23, we all know it, says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No sin is more excusable than the other. No sin is any less forgivable for another. Now, uh, the impact of some sins can be different. Some can be more pervasive uh, in a society. Some may carry broader consequences, and that's true with some of the issues that we're dealing with here, because when you look back on cultures where those things were prevalent, uh, you can see how it all turned out. But the ultimate result of any and all sin is separation from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Any, any wrongdoers here? Okay, a few of those. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, all kinds of sexual immorality, nor idolaters, which is anybody who puts at any point anything of a precedence over God. Nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, or thieves, or greedy, or drunkards, or slanders, even stuff you say, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And listen to verse 11, and that is what some of you were. That stuff we came out of, but you were washed, you were sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of God. I look in there, I notice all those sins, and there are several other patches that do the same thing, where they'll mention the stuff we're talking about here, and then there's a lot of other real common stuff in there. And you can't just single one out. That's why we need to approach everyone with humility. Because apart from God, we would all be facing an identity crisis. The world wants us to believe that what we all have in common, we looked at this last week, is that we're just all somewhere on the spectrum of sexual orientation and, and gender identity. But what Christians need to realize is that what we really all have in common is that apart from Christ, we're all lost. We're all disoriented. We all are at odds with God, and our ways are not His, not even close. So it honestly doesn't matter whether you've accepted the truth or you're still searching for the truth. We need to approach both God and others with a sense of humility. And just like we don't get to determine our own truth, we don't get to dispense our own judgment either. Because our part is to show the same grace that God has shown us. And that doesn't mean compromising the truth. It doesn't mean, uh, because that's disingenuous to do that too. I mean, for churches to do all kinds of things to appear like they're relevant, but never really let people know where they stand in all this. I understand not putting certain things out on the front page and driving people away before they ever have a chance to see what God may want to do with them. But even the LGBTQ community is beginning to tell us, they just want to know where churches stand. And I'll get to that in just a second. Now, by the way, before I turn a corner here, look back at, uh, at 1 Corinthians 6. Is that still up there? Do we have that? We got to scramble getting some media stuff together because it was jumbled from last week. But 1 Corinthians 6, Paul listed those same sex relations with a lot of other things that all separate us from God. And at the end of that passage, he makes it clear that God can cleanse us from how much of it? From all of it. If we turn from our ways and surrender to his way. So I want to challenge all of us need to approach this topic with humility. But I want to challenge any of you also, maybe questioning your orientation or searching for identity, because you too need to keep a posture of humility toward God. And that means being willing to admit that just maybe God wants something different for yourself than you want for yourself. And it's not getting any easier to admit that. So many churches these days are shortchanging God's grace and basically telling everybody that there's no need to change. You're okay as you are. If you believe in God, then that's really okay. You know, you're okay just as you are, but none of us is okay as we are. 
That's why we need Christ. One of my former staff, sharp guy, developed a lot of material with him over the years, some on this very subject. He instigated an annual forum that brought people together for constructive dialogue on issues related to the LGBTQ community. And listening to feedback from people coming out of those forums, I heard people from his church saying, you know what, I'm starting to understand, maybe, maybe see people in a different light. And that's okay if it means gaining insight on how to reach people. But then I remember at the same time, those on the other side coming out of these dialogues and saying, you know, I'm more confident than ever that God may be this way and I don't need to change. And it became very apparent which direction things were going and who was influencing whom. Within a couple of years, that church left the fellowship, joined a different denomination, and now they elect LGBTQ board members and to my knowledge have no trouble with same-sex marriage. And I have to ask myself, are they really reaching people by encouraging them to believe that they don't need to change? Because the truth is, we all need to change. That's why the one requirement God puts on us to receive a new life is repentance. We, we can't receive the new one if we're not willing to give up the old one. And I'm not talking about salvation by works or efforts. Because repentance basically means we wave the white flag on our own life and we give up. And we surrender. And we basically say, say God, I want you to have your way. It's your plan, not mine. In fact, Proverbs 14, 12 talks about it. It says there are ways that seem right to us, but the end, those ways lead to what? To death. Now that may sound kind of harsh, but I cannot overemphasize how destructive our own ways and desires are. The basic definition of all sin is simply going our own way, and it all leads to death. That's why Jesus gave his life. He didn't just give his life to, to affirm our desires and feelings about ourselves, but to literally change us from the inside out. And any of our attempts to redefine ourselves are futile because only God knows who he made us to be, and only he can remake us to fit that purpose, but only as we humble ourselves and let him have his way. You know, people can celebrate pride, they can march for pride, but the Bible talks about pride in a lot different light. And I say this to everybody, because on both ends, we need that humility. Because James 4, 6 says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We considered this last week. Grace is not just a mercy term, it's a power term. It's not just about forgiveness, it's about enablement. And God extends grace to us because we can't change on our own. But if we humble ourselves toward God, he will enable us to do what we cannot do. What we might even think we, we don't even need to do. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy or that life is fair and how it doles out struggles. Because I'll be honest, maybe your struggle will be harder than mine. Just like there are people all over the world who are born into hardship that none of us will ever know. But regardless of your status... Or your struggles, God expects humility. Because when anyone, saint or sinner, refuses to conform to God's purposes and plans, that puts us at odds with God. Because to stay in right relationship with Him, we need to be willing to open up the Word and to look into it with an, with an open mind and an open heart. And if I see anything in my life that doesn't line up with what I see in here, I say, God, help me to be what you want me to be, not what I think that I should be. Because the issue should never be what we think about ourselves. We're born with, with inclinations from the outset that separate us from God. That's why he calls us to repent, to change our mind and our direction. And that's, again, something we can't do on our own. But, but repentance is not some uh, dark, heavy term of condemnation. Repentance is a term of liberation because it sets us free to start over. But to do it in a way that may not seem natural or right to me, but to make sure that it's in line with God's purposes. So whether you've accepted the truth, whether you're struggling with the truth, or you're still searching for the truth, our posture, every one of us, needs to be one of humility toward God. You know, society instills us from the time we're childhood. I remember listening to those songs when my daughter's little. They're still out there. It tells us that we need to accept and love ourselves just as we are. And that sounds really nice and affirming and all, but when it comes to God's purposes, it's never about uh, our acceptance. It's about God's acceptance. And while he takes us as we are, he doesn't leave us that way. But unless we submit ourselves to his plan, we're never going to discover who he made us to be. So we all need humility toward God. Now, I want you to hear this. I don't want you to hear it wrong. But I believe there's going to be people one day who may have struggled with this issue their entire lives to the very end. 
But they had the humility to come before God and to acknowledge that regardless of their feelings, regardless of their inclinations, they're willing to submit to what seems awful clear in his word and say, Lord, help me to trust your truth and not my own. Give me the strength to resist that temptation and help me to be what you want me to be. And I believe there's going to be a lot of people in that state who find themselves a place of eternity with God. And by the same token, I believe there's going to be many one day who profess loyalty to God and his truth, but without demonstrating Christ's character, without the humility and compassion that reflects Jesus' love for the lost. And because they refuse to extend that kind of kindness like God's that can lead people to repentance, I believe there's going to be a lot of people like that who find themselves separated from God for eternity. And that's a pretty pretty sobering thought to where each of us may be tonight. But that brings me to the final point that I want to make. We've contrasted God's unshakable truth with the world's wavering truth. We consider the need for humility both from those who follow Christ and those who may struggle to follow him. But this next point is completely on us. Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor right there and I want you to say, this is on you. All right, this is on you. I turn to the ones in front of you and behind you. You've been wanting to do this all the time. Point their finger, Ellie. Hit in their face. Say, this is on you. All right, this is on you. All right, that's intermission there. I'll have you on your feet before seven. All right. Here's the deal, guys. We cannot expect those who don't follow Christ to to have what I'm talking about here, but we should always be able to expect this from those who claim to follow him. You know, contemporary culture is going to give little, if any, benefit of doubt to any of us who take issue with the lifestyles and identities and things we're considering here. In fact, I can tell you you can do everything right, You can show the character and compassion of Christ, but unless you affirm the world's view, you're still going to be labeled as unenlightened, intolerant, uh, homophobic, bigoted, whatever label they want to pin on you. The question is, how are we going to respond to those things? Because the fact of the matter is, truth with humility will always yield compassion. Truth with humility will always lead us to compassion. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's not going to be easy. Because it's not human nature to be gracious when you feel that people are in your face. Which is a reason why a lot of people have the issue they do with us because Christians have not always responded with grace. And I want you to hear me, I'm not saying in any way that I'm advocating that we keep silent or that we uh, soften up on our stance or that we don't, we worry so much about perceptions that we never dare to speak up about anything. But there is a time and a place to address things. And I can tell you this, social media is not that place. It's too terse. It doesn't allow for any uh, depth or clarity. Uh, People respond without any discretion and essentially gets people all riled up and it really doesn't convince a soul other than those who already share your view. So if you're trying to do it in that forum, knock it off because it's, it's not working with anybody. Now, that said, I understand that for a long time now, those in the LGBTQ community have been claiming to be a marginalized segment of society. Now, uh, the term marginalized is basically a journalistic term, and it means that something is kind of uh, pushed to the side, or, or it's left out of the story, or it's relegated to some side note, or it's just not getting fair consideration. And, and in times past, that's been undeniably true for people in the LGBTQ community. But it's getting harder to honestly claim marginalized status when these issues dominate the headlines as they do. And every storyline in the news and entertainment and politics and education. And I understand that minorities often need to push for a voice in society. But in many aspects of culture, you know it as well as I do, people are celebrated and made heroes by coming out. And this agenda is beginning to dominate everything. My daughter's been in leadership at a secular university for years. I can tell you that every leadership gathering they have, some are two and three hours long, at least two-thirds of the time are spent just on the issue of gender identity alone. Because these things are dominating the discussions. Now, I'm not going to act like we're the victims here because Christians still hold considerable influence in politics and culture. But the tide is turning. And Christians are gradually being removed from the story and pushed to the margins of society. And many would just as soon rid the culture of our influence. And the label of homophobia uh, takes aim at anyone who takes issue with any of the things we're talking about here. And because a phobia is really uh, technically an irrational fear, that term really becomes in a lot of ways a power play to intimidate people from, uh, I don't want to seem like I'm fearful of anything, and I definitely don't want to seem like I'm making someone the victim of hate. 
And most of the time, neither angle is accurate in describing people like you and me who simply have a principal disagreement based on something that's more time-tested and credible and eternally enduring than any human viewpoint. And yet I do need to challenge us tonight that we need to make sure and guard against any actions that may truly be discriminatory or hateful because we've seen the pushback that comes from that when we haven't treated people maybe as we should or their perception has just been that we haven't. But are we going to respond with the same harshness and contempt toward people who reject God's truth and, and then resent us for it? Or are we going to obey Jesus' instruction to show love for those who hate us and kindness to those who mistreat us? Here's the question I, I want to leave you with tonight. If you go thinking about anything, this is a question I want you to have on your mind. Because Christians haven't always acted with humility when others were truly marginalized. We were often quicker to judge than we were to show compassion if we're honest. But how we treated people when they were marginalized is one thing. It may have been, been good or bad. But how we respond as they marginalize us is the real question. How are we going to respond as they begin to marginalize us? That's the true test of character and compassion in us. And that's what's going to make all the difference in whether or not they see Christ in us. In, first, in John 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, that's the part where the religious leaders brought to Jesus that woman caught in adultery. And the law they cited to condemn her was from Leviticus 20.10. One of the passages we looked at last week with all the, the uh, kinds of sexual activity outside of marriage. And the Pharisees were correct that according to those laws, the woman deserved to die. Jesus ne never disagreed with that. But when he bent down and he wrote in the sand and then he looked up and he said, whoever is without sin can cast the first stone. He was basically saying that every one of you deserved that same penalty. Because we can all identify with the sinfulness of the woman. We can all identify with the judgment of the Pharisees. Quick to condemn when, when we ourselves are not perfect. But the one we really need to identify with is Jesus. Because if Jesus reached out and he shielded that guilty person. Not from their own guilt. But from the attacks of others. And he turned to her. And he began to restore. And, and, and he said, you know, I'm not going to condemn you either. He didn't, he didn't excuse the sin. He said it needed to stop. But Jesus was more concerned with restoration than condemnation. And because he reached out with grace, he gave her the opportunity to change. Are we going to give people that same kind of opportunity? People struggling with this, Galatians 6.1 says that if anyone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. I can tell you one thing. People who are struggling with these issues don't need our judgment. That's going to come one day against everyone who refused to turn from their own way. But that's God's place, not ours. Our place right now is that we need to hold out the truth to people, but not to use it as a club to beat them back down into some spiritual pit. Our place is to hold out that truth like a, like a lifeline, like a rope, reaching down in that they can grab hold of, to pull themselves out of it. And when they come up, they may be covered with some mud and bruises, but we continue to show compassion. We continue to reach out. The Bible says do good to those who oppose you. It doesn't matter whether they receive it or not, because God's kindness is what can lead people to that point of radical transformation. The gospel is going to be offensive to some. Some wouldn't even like that analogy. They resent the fact they even need to be saved. But Jesus told us that his gospel would be offensive. And we could do all the right things and we can reach out with compassion and grace and mercy and people are still going to put us off. But Jesus said that isn't the determination of whether you keep extending my kindness because that's the only thing that's going to show them their need for repentance. Now again, I want to be clear. Compassion doesn't mean changing our views or withholding the truth. We show compassion by our actions. Because if they uh, keep uh, hearing that we're hateful and homophobic and bigoted and judgmental and whatever else they choose, and yet we're the ones out there uh, serving our community, we're the ones out there feeding the hungry and cleaning neighborhoods and praying for people, then they might start to question the validity of all those labels, and they might begin to open their mind to our message. People need to see in this culture that too much disagreement doesn't equate with hate. 
People already know that they're accepted by people who agree with them. That, that, we don't need to change. Too many people try to change. They think we've got to become like everybody else to show them how relevant we are. What they really need to see is that people who they know disagree with them can continue to reach out with love and compassion and kindness. That's the kind of love that's really going to stand out and make a life-changing impact. I'm not talking about a misguided sense of compassion that tries so hard to be uh, relevant and, and, and that it becomes uh, disingenuous and patronizing. I read about a church who tried to show inclusiveness by raising the rainbow flag amongst all the other flags outside of their, their church or where they supported missions. I, I heard just a couple weeks ago about uh, a believer who was trying to show kindness to a transgender person by driving them to the hospital the day of their transition surgery. Compassion is not uh, uh, something that, it's not enablement. It doesn't require us to conceal the truth until we think it's time to share it, until the time is right. Last week, you remember, I cited that organization, uh, that LGBTQ advocacy group that um, monitors churches to see where they stand and all the issues, and they reported the New York Times that they couldn't even tell where, where half of the, the top 100 churches stood on this issue. But one of the things they said is, we're not trying to change all these churches, that's not our agenda at this point, but what we want, do advocate for is openness about their views. He said a lot of times LGBTQ individuals like to go to these churches, but at least they want to know where they stand. So even people who disagree with her are saying they want us to be clear where we're at. Now you might think, why would, they even, why would they even come to a place like that? Well, I can tell you this. Whether people realize it or not, they are still searching for something. They are still searching for a peace and a purpose, maybe for an identity that they think they found in some other way. But what they'll discover somewhere down the road is that they still aren't satisfied. And what they thought would bring clarity and purpose to their lives has done no such thing. And they're still going to find themselves walking down a lonely path in search of answers. And somewhere along the way, if they encounter you or I, people they've written off, people they've opposed and vilified, and yet we're the ones willing to come alongside and reach out with help and hope. And if they can see in us even a glimmer of that love and joy and peace that everybody is looking for, then maybe they'll be open to the message we have to share. But they're never going to open up if we keep looking at them like they're beyond God's grace. Because I don't care how far a person may seem from God, as long as there's still breath, there's hope. And if they can't find new, ho new hope at new hope, then we might as well plow over the sign and lock the doors for good because they will see no need to let Christ come into their life. Why would they ever need to uh, see a need to change if they don't see a hope for change in us? Now, the thing we got to keep in mind is we can't expect people to change before they come. In fact, I want to tell you this. Even after God transforms people on the inside, and you know this, there's still some things on the outside that may be slow to change. If they can ever change. If I, let me tell you what I, what I mean by this. I think in the days ahead, some of those who are going to need compassion the most are some of those on the far end of the spectrum that we talked about last week. People who have not only redefined themselves, but who have literally remade themselves physically. In other words, they may have already gone through a, a full transition in their gender identity by the time they realize that, that maybe those who, who claim to support them, that they're just victims of the system. I've looked a lot at the language that uh, activist organizations, even psychologists, use when they're addressing these issues with children. And they use terms like how you feel on the inside or the inner sense that you have about who you are. And if that feeling on the inside doesn't match what you look like on the outside, then it's your feeling, it's your inner sense that matters more than your biology or, or your anatomy. And basically what they're telling young people is just go with what you feel on the inside and we'll help you make the change on the outside if you need to. And that's one of the huge ironies of all this, because they tell you you can't change, you don't need to change, and yet they're going to come alongside you and help you change this huge aspect of yourself. And I can't speak for other people, but if I'm going to let anybody change me, I want to let it be God, rather than somebody who's playing God with my psychology and my physiology. It may seem compassionate and affirming to let people decide their, their own identity. And you know what? That's appealing to some. To say that some people aren't doing some of this just because they want to take control of their own destiny. We read some quotes last week from people who basically said that. But to let a 78 year old child determine who they are for life based on what they feel like at that age, 
Professionals who are still honest about it admit, even those who advocate for change down the road are saying that children should not be saddled with those type of life-altering decisions. Most of the time, your kids, as you know, have a hard time figuring out what they're supposed to wear in the winter, what they should eat for breakfast, and yet we're letting them make uh, their life-altering decisions about their identity and gender based on how they feel at that point in time. I mean, science tells, shows us that their brains aren't even fully developed by that time. And yet there's legislation making its way through our state house right now that could eventually lead to ministers and even parents being reported by mandatory reporters as abusive if they try to dissuade or question a child who's in the process of making that sort of decision. But on the other hand, they can take and prescribe dangerous drugs to block the onset of puberty while they're preparing for surgeries that mutilate or remove perfectly healthy body parts. And I look at that and say, what reasonable person can imagine that maybe somehow from this process is going to cause even more emotional turmoil down the road? But for so long, they've been so successful in the can't change lie that they're now just applying it to every letter that gets added to the LGBTQ alphabet. And they've created these pseudo-scientific gender identity tests. I saw one from my daughter's college the other day, and they're giving it to college students right now, but they've got stuff, even their graphs are dying for children. It's called like the gender unicorn. And on there, they're taking this, this test based on a lot of these uh, basically feeling-based questions, very vague things. Like what percentage do you think you are on the orientation scale? What percentage percentage on the gender identity scale? What percentage on the attraction scale? Then they put all this together to come up to terms with any one of dozens identities. And oh, that can't change, by the way. And I look at that, no disrespect, but I say, give me a break. If I took that thing in another month, it would change based on how I feel. If people can't change, why is all of a sudden a detransitioning becoming a thing? We looked last week about several quotes from younger people already admit that they might feel different in 10 years about their gender than they do already. People are rethinking things. Is, is it any surprise, especially to us who are older, that maybe people aren't going to think the same as they did when they were younger? And this is what we're putting on people. And we're causing them to make decisions for their life based on these things. The bottom line is we live in a confused world. And I don't have all the answers for how we're going to navigate this, but what I do know is that when people come to the end of themselves and their own reality, and they start to wonder, just maybe God does have something better for me, they're going to be ostracized in many cases by the same community that once supported their choice because all of a sudden the, the faith decision doesn't fit the agenda. And that's going to leave a lot of hurting people in a literal no man's land or no person's land. And they're going to need a friend and an advocate to come alongside them, willing to extend compassion and kindness, so that by the time they realize that their own path hasn't really led to any peace, they can still see that there's a hope for change through us. But before they reach that point, they might come to you or me with questions. They might even make their way into this place. And when they do, what are they going to find? Are they fine when they're looking for things that no form of self-expression or sexual transition has, has provided the answer? Are they going to find grace and compassion here? Or are we going to look at them like they've committed the unpardonable sin? Because that's the way a lot of them feel. Truth without compassion brings condemnation. Jesus said in John 3.17, we know John 3.16, this is the other side of that. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. That's pretty consistent with what Jesus said to the woman. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Are we going to give people that chance? What if somebody does come in here in the days ahead? I, I can tell you, this is going to happen. That's why I'm dealing with this now. What if they come into this place and they've already assumed a new identity? They've literally undergone that physical transition, whether it's obvious to us or not. Are we confident that God can work in them just like he's worked in us? Because 1 Corinthians 6, 11 said that such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Are we going to say to them that just because they've transformed themselves on the outside, that God is not capable of transforming them on the inside? Do we truly believe that when someone surrenders to Christ that he can redeem everything about their past? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone who belongs to Christ, he's become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. I don't know what that change will look like for everybody because in a lot of cases, we might actually be talking about a lifestyle change. 
It may be one thing if somebody comes in here and they're coming out of a same-sex relationship and they can just step out of that and, and make that change. But what about that person who's made the transition? In some cases, some of that can be undone, but it's not without risk. And I have to ask myself, is that the answer? I don't have all the answers. Those are some of the tough issues we're going to face along the way. I just had to ask you tonight, are we ready to receive those who come? Are we prepared for the aftercare? Are we prepared for the discipleship process and helping them through things that are not going to be easy? Because the fact of the matter is, if we can't show grace to people who are struggling before they come to Christ, then how in the world are we going to help those who continue to struggle after they come to Him? I don't have all the answers, but I do know that walking people down a path of truth once they've found it is not going to be easy. It's going to be a confusing and messy process at times. And we're going to need the same grace that the new believer needs to walk us through this and help us navigate these difficult waters. But remember, grace is much more than mercy and forgiveness. Grace is enablement. And God will help us to do what we cannot do on our own. And with the grace and guidance and power of the Holy Spirit, we can navigate these waters and we can reach that destination that God intends for all of us. Do you believe it? Stand with me. It's time to spend some time in prayer tonight. I'm going to call all of us to pray in one of three ways. And I don't need to know how you're praying unless you want us to pray with you individually, and we'll do that. But first of all, if you know that your attitude needs adjustment on this issue, you've held to the truth, but perhaps you struggled to sense that compassion that, uh, that we need, that can, can kindness that can lead others to repentance. I know I've struggled with that at times. I struggled with it this week when somebody sent me some stuff on this. And there's issues I just can get angry about. And you find yourself maybe in that place like, God, I, I just need help to sense your kindness. If that's you or not, I ask you and encourage you and challenge you to humble yourself before God and ask him to give you his heart for those who are caught in this struggle. Secondly, if you're here tonight and you're personally struggling with issues of, of sexual identity or, or orientation and gender identity... And you want God's best for your life. I'm also going to challenge you tonight to humble yourself before him. And in a few moments to make your way to this altar. And to humble yourself and say, God, I want you to change my heart. And change my mind. Not just toward you, but even about myself. Now that flies in the face of people who say these things can't change. But I'm telling you what, I can't change anybody. I'm not even going to try. But believe me, I wouldn't put it past God to be able to do anything when it comes to him having his way in our lives. And so just ask him what that is. What is it, God, that you want from me? Because I want your way and not my own. And finally, if you're here tonight and you love the truth and you're ready to love people as God does, I want to challenge you to spend a few moments as well because tonight I want you to call on God for all of us that we become more effective at sharing grace and truth and that we would all have his grace in navigating some of these treacherous waters that we're going to need to in the days ahead because he's going to help us disciple people literally from all walks of life. And you can find your place of prayer anywhere tonight. I know that's why you can find it where you're at. But I'm going to challenge as many of you as possible to make your way down here tonight. For no other reason, I want you to make it easier for those who may be stepping out and surrendering their will to God and say, God, I need a new start. And it's simple as acknowledging, God, I've gone my own way. That's what sin is. I know that's not your way. I know you died to take that sin away from me. I believe you're the Son of God who died in my place and rose again with the power and authority to give me new life. It's as simple as that. And if you're making that prayer tonight, well, the others may come down and just find a place to kneel and to pray. I'm going to ask you, if you want prayer for that and the other thing, you would just come and stand. There will be a pastor here to meet you or a, or a prayer team member to meet you here, and we'll pray with you individually and believe that God is going to do something special in your life, and he's going to give you a sense of direction and identity that only he can give you. So would you begin to just come tonight, find that place tonight? This is a serious issue, guys. We are going to encounter these things in days ahead. And if nothing else, we need to pray God's grace on that. When that time comes, we know how to respond with grace and compassion and humility, reaching out to people who literally will be in need of transformation from God. Would you come find that place tonight? If you want prayer yourself or you're surrendering your life to his, just come and stand and we'll, we'll, we'll come and we'll pray with you as well. But just find a place for a few moments tonight and let God seal this message in your hearts because in the days ahead, we're all going to need his heart on these issues.